WFJA 105.5, Sanford, Pinehurst, Southern Pines. It's now time for the Recovery Boys, Lewis Finch and Macon Moy, as they spend the next hour with you discussing the issues of alcoholism and drug addiction, as well as the road to recovery. Here's Lewis and Macon. So good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's Macon Moy. Um, Lewis is on the road tonight taking care of some business, and um, we have a very able replacement, um, our buddy Mike. And I asked Mike when we were sitting in, and we were kind of going over the format of the show, um, asked him, I said, what is your title? Uh, and he started kind of smiled at me. He said, just introduce me as Mike, and I work at Wellwind Outpatient. <laughs> so welcome, Mike. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So... Let's get a little bit of house cleaning out of the way here. Um, if you want to visit us, um, obviously, if you're listening to us on the radio, you're all set. But if you have somebody that's outside our listening area, you can go to our website, which is therecoveryboys.com. Um, all of our old um, episodes, our podcast, as we call them, um, are sitting there on the site. Uh, and there's also a listen live button. Um, if you have any interest in giving us a call tonight, um, anytime during the show, you can reach us at 866-465-3110. And we always welcome um, phone calls, conversations. Um, also, there's a, on the website, there's a, there's a place where you can reach out to us via email. And um, if we don't have the answer tonight, we will certainly get it for you and we'll cover it um, in the following shows. Uh, we weren't on last week, uh, Mike, the Carolina-Notre Dame game preempted us. And so we're working on being able to not miss these weeks at a time. But I'm pretty excited um, about the show tonight. Um, we have as our guest, first off, we'll, we'll check in and we'll bring him on the line here in one second. We'll check in with, uh, with our buddy Chris, who's um, in recovery. And um, we're, we're going to talk to him the first of each show just to say hey to him and, you know, find out how he's doing, um, hoping that he'll continue on his road to recovery and sobriety. Um, but our guest tonight is the former uh, governor of the state of North Carolina, Pat McCrory. And um, Pat's a great guy. I've known him for a long time. We were um, friends in a different life in Charlotte. Um, but, you know, the, the questions, I had a conversation with Pat earlier and um, we wanted to talk about this drug, ap you know, this drug epidemic, the opiate epidemic, um, alcoholism, the mental illness. And Pat will have a unique um, view from a state perspective and also from a federal perspective since he ran the state. I just have some questions about how the system works. Um, you know, Mike, you and I discussed earlier just some insurance questions that don't make sense to us. And, you know, the one thing I will... Uh, you know, say at the very start, I believe that we're probably one of the, maybe the only show in North Carolina, talk show in North Carolina, dedicated to the conversation about addiction and alcoholism and mental illness. Um, and so the goal, and I didn't really say this to you, Mike, but the goal um, of this show is to become a resource for our listeners and for people who are suffering. You know, families, a couple of weeks ago we had a show about the cost of addiction to the family and how it's a family disease. And, you know, Mike, you, you can, I'll let you speak to that in a second, but um, it's, it's just, a, there's, there's so much to cover um, and there's so few places that people can go and get real answers. And, you know, you're on the front line. I'm on the front line. Lewis is on the front line. My wife, Taylor, we're, we're on the front line of this thing. And we see things uh, in a very unique way. Um, not, not to mention, you know, I'm in recovery myself, and so I see it from that perspective as well. So um, before we get started and let Mike um, chime in a little bit, I do want to bring uh, Chris on the line and see how he's doing. Hey, good evening, Chris. Hey, Mike. How are you doing tonight, buddy? I'm making it. Good, good. I want you to say hey to Mike. Uh, hey, Chris, Mike, how are you? Mike, uh, Mike works at Wellwind Outpatient in Raleigh. Um, so tell us, okay. what kind of week, tell us what kind of week you've had. Oh, uh, it's been, um, I'd say a little up and down. Yeah. But, um, all around it's been okay, though. I've been able to go to work and, um, do some normal things like that and go to the gym. And, um, 
other than that, like it's just been normal. Well, good, good. And, and you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Chris, is that, you know, one of the things that we always talk about in recovery is building a new platform of friends, new guys to hang out with. Are you, are you been, are you able to do that? Um, expanding your horizons a little bit. I mean, what do you do to help yourself stay sober? I'd say um, I definitely try to stay in touch with people in recovery. Um, surrounding myself with um, positive people, whether they be um, in recovery or or just people that don't drink or use in a, and I'd say a really big thing that's helped me is uh, being able to go to the gym and, and blow off some steam. Well, that, that's, I'm, I'm, you know, we, you and I talk every day and I'm, the gym has been a great addition as well as you've been very successful. Uh, Mike, any questions for Chris? No, Chris, I congratulate you on the, the recovery time you have, and I know every day is a struggle. If you could give someone on the verge of making that decision, making a change, what would you go back and tell them? I'd say uh, you, might, you might as well go ahead and get honest and tell it all. And, um, and, and follow directions. Has, has that was that honesty? Was that hard for you, Chris? It, it's definitely been um, the dishonesty has been one of the biggest things that's taken me out every time. It it typically is after getting honest with your addiction, your recovery. Doesn't it lift a burden off of you where you feel like, wow, I, I should have done this so so much sooner? And it, I'd say so, but I'd also say it's a daily thing. It's a great point. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. You know, we talk about day at a time and, you know, in the 12-step fellowships, the various fellowships and smart recovery and all the different ways that people find to try and um, achieve sobriety, long-term sobriety, I think is the goal. Um, but, you know, Mike mentioned, we were talking earlier, Harm reduction, you know, that is, that, that's a buzzword for this industry that's important for people to understand what that is. That is, sometimes total abstinence is a pipe dream. I mean, sometimes it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But if you can decrease the amount of danger and the, the, the things that you've done to yourself and reduce that harm, um, those are steps towards sobriety. You know, I think that we all in recovery would love to have the goal of, of long-term sobriety. Um, but sometimes it's, it's a challenge, and you, you and I talk about that all the time. Um, so so I'm, I'm proud of you. Um, you know, I hope you'll keep on keeping on. Um, all right. And, you know, keep on doing what you're supposed to be doing. And um, we're going to talk to you every week. You know, every week we hope that things get a little bit easier and a little bit better for you. All right. I'll thank you, Mason. All right, buddy. I'll, we'll, we'll catch up tomorrow, all right? Thanks, all right, now. Okay, that's cool. And so, um, Mike, you know, you deal with these guys on a daily basis. What other what, what things do you hear from these guys um, that you would, if somebody out there listening that's got, that's got an addiction or, you know, a, a, an a alcoholism or a drug addiction or even some mental illness, I mean, that honesty is a big thing. What else, do, what else words of wisdom would you give these, somebody who's listening tonight? Be honest, uh, reach out to the people who love you the most, uh, connect with family. Uh, what I hear a lot, uh, young men especially, is that they, they have this empty feeling that they're trying to fill, this void that they're trying to fill. And when you start talking to them about family, they're like, yeah, I have family, but, but we're not close. And so reaching out to family and, and having that family support structure for a lot of people can help. Um, being honest, accepting help, uh, putting the fear aside, putting the shame aside. And for someone that, you know, doesn't have a, a lot of family, someone like me, um, you got to utilize those people that you want to draw closer to, those friends. You know, you, you have your biological family. Uh, and then you have the family that you create, whether those are workplace relationships, whether those are church relationships, whether those are just, you know, relationships in the community. Uh, having that connection 
uh, is really what a lot of these young men tell me helps them more than anything else is that that connection that feeling of belonging to something what well, you know what maybe I should take a step backwards because everything you said is so true but we should probably allow you to ex explain or uh, introduce yourself to don't, our listeners and tell us a little bit about don't yourself. Don't do that to me. Come on, Mike. Come don't on. Do I told to you, <laughs> this is a, a chance to be honest with everybody just listening. Uh, everybody's going to listen. But just tell us a little bit about how you ended up in this control room with me tonight. Somebody called and asked me to be here. <laughs> no. Um, so I am with Well and Outpatient in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I work with Lewis uh, many, many facets. You know, anything from working with families uh, motivating people to take that first step into recovery, you know. Um, and so he, he's actually doing the work tonight. You know, you mentioned he's on the road. He's, he's doing the work. He's getting somebody to treatment. So he asked me to step in. What got me here into this industry, I, I really can't put an answer to it. I've always had a, a servant's heart, always had a penchant to help people mm -hmm. and never really knew why. Uh, and then I, was, I had the fortunate opportunity to work with Lewis in this industry, and I've learned a little bit about myself over the last few years doing this, that um, a lot of it stems from my childhood. A lot of it stems from my family story. And while I'm not a person in recovery, uh, I have a, a recovery story in my family. Um, you know, addiction hit my family hard. Uh, my mother's side of the family, my father's side of the family, uh, but not just addiction, mental health, depression. Um, it's, it's hit my siblings pretty hard. And uh, I've watched it. I've grown up around it. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to impact some change into people's lives now. It's, it's, um, it's, it's never a dull moment if you're going to be in this industry. And I think that having the heart of a servant is one of those things that is a prerequisite to thrive in the industry. Um, you know, you, as you mentioned, you, you were impacted by addiction from a family perspective. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago we had that show on the cost, the cost of addiction to the families. And it really is a family disease, isn't it? It absolutely is. Uh, it hits families from, from all angles. Uh, it's the, ge the, the genetic component. It's the environmental component. Yeah. You know, you, you told me a little bit about Chris's backstory. I mean, from the age of nine, yeah. being introduced to this, I, I can't fathom what his life has been like. Yeah. It's, we had, um, I was in a discussion on Monday night about um, self acceptance. And that's one of those things that he struggled with because he's really got no perspective other than what he's been around his whole life. That's right. And, and so, you know, that's the thing. Um, and we, we talk about treatment on the show a lot. And treatment's a big element of the road towards um, sobriety or some kind of normal living, whatever that is for everybody. It's different. But, you know, one of the things that is, is for sure, and uh, especially given what you guys do at Wellwyn, um, treatment's the start of it. It's not the finish. You don't, no. you don't get fixed in treatment. You get set up to be successful but if you don't have a plan if you don't have some plan in place um th your chances of 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 you know living in remission because an addict or an alcoholic is an addict or an alcoholic for life i mean i i'm an i'm an alcoholic and i'm a drug addict and i'll be that way my whole life but i'm currently living in remission because i have a good plan a good program a good plan and that's what we try and do for the people that we work with. I know that's what you do. You guys do it well in is that you try and help them extend that day-to-day -day sobriety that's so important. And it's funny, you know, I, I, I've got an addictive personality. I'm addicted to playing golf. I'm addicted to so many different things. And now I'm addicted to being sober. And, you know, that's uh, addiction, addiction can, um, it, it can work for you. Um, but it has to be managed like anything else. And so I'm glad that you're here tonight. I appreciate uh, – I know Lewis is, is, is carrying the ball for somebody else, and I think that's amazing. Absolutely. Um, and, he, you know, he's, he's like that. So, But let's get on to um, the rest of the show tonight. I'm very excited about our guest. Um, he's a friend of mine. I've known, I've known him for a long time. Um, he's the, he was the mayor of Charlotte 
Let me get my facts and figures, and I, we'll bring him on in one second here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was the mayor uh, in Charlotte from 1995 to 2009, and then he was our governor of um, the state of North Carolina from 2013 to 2017. His name's Pat McCrory. He's a, he's a great guy. He currently has his own um, talk show, radio talk show, the Pat McCrory Show. What's he doing with on With Bo Thompson. That's exactly right. <laughs> I still, I still from the old days, and we'll talk about that a little bit. When we'll bring Pat on here in a second, but we've been friends for a long time, and Pat's a wonderful guy. He's a he's a tremendous leader. Um, and when I asked him to be on the show and told him what we were talking about, he was quick to agree to because he sees firsthand the cost of addiction. Um, you know, I mean, he ran our state, so he you know he was aware of that problem. So let's let's bring Pat on and say good. Good evening to him, and uh, and see how he's doing. Hey, Pat, how are you doing tonight, Governor? Hey, hey, friend, make it uh, good to hear from you. Make it more. I'm proud of you too. Well, I'm well, very, very proud of you. Well, buddy, I can't tell you how much I appreciate. It. You know, I was telling somebody, um, we uh, we've known each other for a long time. Back in my John Boy and Billy days, um, when when you know Pat was the mayor. I'm telling you, we had some good times, and he would come in and he could hold his own with John Boy and Billy. And there's not very many people that could do that. We used to have a lot of good times, and now they're actually my competition. I'm stealing a lot from those old days <laughs> on my new radio show here in Charlotte. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was a great learning lesson for me. When I was a, a, a city council member in 1989, I went on John Boy and Billy for the first time. And, and I, in fact, started writing some material for John Boy and Billy. I always thought I... Another life for me could have been a Saturday Night Live script writer. <laughs> of course, in politics, sometimes you think you're in a Saturday Night Live Saturday Night Live skit. And that's the truth. And you just want to you just want to snap your fingers and go, "Is this really happening, <laughs> or is this a skit?" So well, uh, um, we, we always great we always, memories. You know, we always laugh at it. it it's impo it would be impossible to make up the stuff that actually happens. You don't have enough imagination sometimes for some of the stuff that you guys have to deal with. Um, but no doubt about it. But I volunteered for it, so um, yeah, that's right. It, it was an honor. It was an honor to be mayor and city council member and governor of this great state. Well, and you and you did a great job. There's a lot of us um, that were very proud of all the work that you accomplished for us. But tell us a little bit before we get into the conversation about addiction, alcoholism, and uh, the opiate um, epidemic. Tell us a little bit about your show. Tell us what you're doing, Charlotte. Well, we've got a unique perspective. Uh, I've got a two-hour show every morning from 8 to 10 on 1110 BT and also on uh, radio.com through Intercom. And it's going extremely well. But I give a uh, kind of my tagline is I've played the game. I've been played by the game. I know the game. And I'm here to expose the game <laughs> of politics, culture, and business. And I've been in all three. Uh, you know, because I've been in I've been in the corporate suites, I've been in the mayor's suites, I've been in the governor's suite, and I've been in the Oval Office many times. So I try to give an inside perspective beyond the headlines of what's really going on. And I give a perspective that probably very few people have since I've been in in uh, both business, politics, and many cultural activities. And uh, so whatever news is going on, including the impeachment testimonies today, you know, I can say I've testified in front of Congress, and this is what it's like. This is the pressure you feel. These are the games being played. So um, hopefully it's educational. It, I attempt to give all sides of the story, and we also probably do 20% humor. Well, and no name-calling no name calling allowed on the show, uh, no personal attacks, and no real debates. Uh, it's more of a conversation and me trying to – tell the audience what's happening and uh, and we're doing real well but uh making in two years we've uh more than tripled the ratings so oh, fantastic very that's very pleased well that, that's giving john boy and billy a run for their money <laughs> <laughs> well you know john boy always and, and he'll probably end up uh, you know this will end up getting back to him my brother my youngest brother is actually selling network inventory over there for him again so there's a moy back in the building which probably wow, makes everybody, that's great. probably makes everybody nervous quite honestly but um you know, um, John Boy finally figured out how to get paid like a morning guy and do a show in the afternoon. So it's it's um, yeah, that yeah, was all, does it. <laughs> that was always his goal. Well, well, well Governor, what what I'd really like to get into is, is um, just a conversation about addiction, and alcoholism. What, one of the things I think I told you, I think we're probably the only show completely dedicated to this subject, and you know, we do it from uh, a series of different. 
I mean, different sides. I'm, as you know, I'm in recovery, so I do it because mm-hmm. I always learn more about my disease. Um, we do it to help the, the people that are still suffering, but there is um, a lot of information that we just don't have access to, and I wanted to bring that part of the of the business, if you will. Um, to your attention tonight and just ask you, um, because you've had a unique view of the disease from an administrative perspective. Um, you know, you, you guys must have seen it. And I wanted to do it not only just from, from the state perspective, but also city of Charlotte. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, homelessness, drug addiction, alcoholism, crime, all the things associated with it. Um, it, it's, continues to grow i think that, um if i remember your comment to me it's one of the biggest things facing us as a society today i think it's the number one thing facing a society today in fact i mentioned that in my very first state of state speech that addiction and mental health also are our number one issue and i got like three claps in the <laughs> audience but four years later i think a lot of more people realize that's a very serious issue but when i was a city council member uh, back in the early 1990s, we were having a huge drug ep- epidemic of uh, crack cocaine and heroin. And that was really the beginning uh, in our nation of just a major drug epidemic in addition to alcohol. And, you know, Charlotte was averaging 125 murders a year in 1993, 94, and 95. And I became mayor in 95. And, you know, if you do any minor research, 80% of it was drug or alcohol related. Um either do with dealing or dealing with people with addiction or mental health or homeless or domestic violence. And, you know, a lot of the people in our prisons and our, in our county jails, probably 80 to 90% have addiction issues. Yeah, they do. For and, sure. um, so, you know, this has been following me in every political position I've had from 1989 all the way to my last year as governor where, um, you know, I've seen families destroyed, individuals destroyed, people lose their lives, uh, people lose their marriages, people lose their children, people get killed, uh, automobile accidents, and, um, you know, there's so many, and the cost of addiction is just enormous to not only the human tragedy, but the, uh, the tragedy of how much money is being spent as a result of the addiction issue and one of the first things I realized as governor is, you know, we have almost no beds for addiction. You know, the emergency rooms are becoming the beds, and people are just sitting in there. And uh, our county jails and state prison are becoming the beds for addiction. And um, you, you know, Governor, it's, it's I, 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 wanted to stop you, I wanted to stop you on that because I want to expand on that conversation because we're in two small counties, Lee County, Moore County, Richmond County, um, where we don't have – you know, there's no homeless shelter. There's certainly no recovery center. Some of the bigger cities have uh, developed that. But what, what you say is so true, and we struggle with that um, conversation. But this isn't uh, just an, yeah, this isn't just an urban issue. It is a, small towns have it. They might hide it a little more. But, you know, there's, there's a major, uh, you know, from heroin to alcohol to um, the meth is so serious now. Yeah. Um, it's everywhere. There's no family that, or neighborhood or school that is escaping this, and we've got to confront it head on. Well, you know, the, I've talked to both the sheriffs, and, you know, their deputies are not trained to deal with. And mm-hmm. you know what? The local county jail is 25 degrees tonight. It'll be packed with drug addicts and alcoholics because there's no mm-hmm. place for them to go and they'll start detox and then it becomes a medical issue and you know hats off to the deputies you know and the sheriff because they are dealing with a product with a pro a problem they've got no training for and you know i we continue i think to put band-aids on this and this it's i don't know I, I guess my question to you is is what are the conversations like at the highest levels on how to build some kind of measurable plan to address these issues? Well, first, you've got to develop some short-term strategies to deal with the crisis. And when I was governor, for example, in my first year, we started opening up um, 
uh, drug courts and alcoholic courts. You know, so people who were obviously arrested while under the influence, we set up, I, I don't have the exact number of courts that we set up, but I went to a grand opening of a court in uh, Fayetteville where we had a lot of military people being arrested in addiction. And, uh, and we try to put them in rehab and help their families and realize the first thing you can't do is throw them in jail. So, you know, we put a major emphasis on those that are immediately in trouble. Um, and then the next thing we, I try to deal with, and I had an incredible Secretary of Health and Human Services, a doctor by the name of Aldona Voss out of Greensboro. She set up, I, I put together with her major leadership, I got in the room within my first five months in office, all the court system people, all the public safety people, all the hospital people, um, you know, you know, there's so many, all the mental health people, all in a room so we could share information. We tend to be in silos, all dealing with the same people, but there's no comprehensive plan for individuals with a problem. And part of it, by the way, the insurance issue, part of it's the hospital issue. There's no one talking to each other. And, of course, as you know, when someone is addicted, um, they know the system better than anyone often. You know, you'll do anything to get your drug, including abusing the system. Right. You know, going from doctor to doctor or relative to relative, you name it, you'll do it. And I'm not saying, I'm just saying that as a reality. I've had it in my family before. And um, so the system has got to talk to each other as opposed to being in these little pockets of isolation. And so the, my main goal in my short four years as governor was to pull the systems together. Are the judges talking to the sheriffs? Are the sheriffs talking to the police? Are the courts talking to the hospitals? Are the hospitals talking to the mental health facilities? And the list goes on and on and on. And insurance companies, um, it's all interrelated. And to me, that has to be the major goal, where we find out from, you know, uh, excuse me, a shared system where we're seeing what medicine's being allocated, what treatment's being used, what they're doing in the jail, uh, what their job they're doing on the job and it's all interrelated the employers have got to get involved too and be better educated on what addiction does and of course as you know this impacts our economic development we have some jobs like truck drivers where there's a major shortage of truck drivers in north carolina and one reason is because of addiction Hmm. we can't find people to pass drug tests yeah we we have problems in recruiting police officers and and the highway patrol because they cannot we've got so many people in communities who want to become one but they can't pass drug tests even when we tell them there's a drug test they don't pass it and then we have a lot of people losing their jobs due to addiction and then they can't get their jobs back part of that is because of legal issues people are afraid of lawsuits and the other issue is the stigma of quote being an alcoholic or being addicted yeah and um employers don't want to take that risk so it's such a complex issue that um is also he can impacting the availability of a qualified workforce i, I could see that and it, I, I wanted the the drug court thing is is a big deal we're trying to get a drug we'd love to get a drug court in moore county lee county there's i believe there's 18 drug courts in north carolina as of last that's week correct you know that's, so so we, we, yeah, we i think we had 12 when i was in there so i think they're expanding and we we set up a plan to expand its I, I got the funding for the initial drug courts, and I'm it, very, very proud of that. The, listen, you should be. There. I, I have a, a friend of mine, the judge down in Augusta, Georgia, who runs the drug court down there, and he's got facts and figures that would make anybody who doesn't allow a drug court just appear to be uncaring. I mean, the it keeps people from going back to jail, and, and it doesn't ruin their life if they've made one mistake. Um, and so right. I, I, I applaud you for that. Um, but who... Was there one person, um, was it, I mean, from a power perspective, does anybody in the state today or even in the federal government for that, I mean, we all talk about it and the conversation has become much more open. 
Um, I think that the social stigma is reduced some, but it's still people are still embarrassed. Um, you know, I'm I'm very happy to tell people I'm a drug addict and alcoholic because of what I went through and because it helps me with my sobriety. Um, but is there do, do we need to develop a, a whole separate group just to address this? I mean, how would you go about doing that? Well, you got to fight the bureaucracy, and, and, and plus there is some stigma that I think we're breaking through it. You know, I'm a big fan of AA, but, you know, my goal would be where we wouldn't have to make it anonymous anymore because there is no stigma. In fact, you reward people for doing it. And you'd be able, to be, be able to proudly say, I'm an AA, but people are afraid to say it for fear that they might lose their job or lose their marriage or lose their children. Um, and the list goes on and on. Um, i tell you another problem. We send so many mixed signals. You know, one minute, you know, we say you can't smoke cigarettes in public, but then we go, you can smoke pot in public and we don't you know we glorify pot and marijuana and most people don't think that's addictive oh my goodness yeah so, so we have a lot of false information out there and i'm not getting in the debate of whether to legalize or not legalize but whatever we have to we have to educate the public and young people on what addiction is and how some people have a genetic makeup to get addicted so in college one of the first things I did was set up in each of our uni public universities, and we did this in my first year, and I don't know if the Governor Cooper is still doing this, but we set up um, AA programs on each of their major campuses because there's a stigma on even among college students. You know how before every game you got to go get drunk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went to a Carolina game in my third week as governor or something, and I noticed before the game, God, nothing's changed since I was in college. People were getting ripped yep. before going in the stadium, and I was just looking at them, and I was going, you know, twenty percent of these people are going to have some won't finish college. Yeah, they're gone. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, I'm afraid that we have glorified that lifestyle um, in film, TV. Oh. You know, it's always, and it's the the real cost of addiction uh, until, you know, it's funny until the and, and I'm, I'm last person. I'm the last person trying, you know make any comments that are going to come back to hurt me. But until it, this addiction, opiate addiction, creeped into the middle class, everybody was just fine with it not being talked about. But when we started, seeing, when we bigger, started seeing cheerleaders, you know, we started seeing the better schools finding these kids dead in the bathroom, all of a sudden it became an epidemic. Yeah, and one thing I learned as mayor, you know, we'd have major break-ins in neighborhoods, and, you know, you are... are immediate thought in in a elitist way is oh my gosh it must be some construction worker in the neighborhood or or it must be someone of another culture breaking into our houses as we watch on tv but often it was the neighbor's kid stealing next door because they had already stolen all their parents stuff and uh you know in charlotte you know charlotte pretty well in the east over one of the wealthiest neighborhoods i know for a fact when i was mayor it was one a very powerful person in Charlotte. His kid was stealing everything in the uh, neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, so and it, and it's that sixteen or seventeen year old was addicted, and they were going to some of the elite private schools where parents think, "Oh, there's nothing wrong there at that school." When frankly, some of the elite private schools in North Carolina have huge addiction issues. And um, so, you know, I've seen the cycles of heroin and crack and cocaine and and beer and marijuana and um it it can, it can kill individuals and destroy families it, and, and, it, and we're it, not communicating that enough yeah and it does it does it, it's gotten better um governor you know it's gotten better but it's still it's still not something it's still not a comfortable conversation that you hear from and we still do glorify it. We I mean, do. It just is. You know, in songs and, you know, we we don't talk about the ramifications of, hey, man, I've got high last night. The problem is a lot of people don't recover from being high last night. they got to get high again. Well, and especially given the current class of drugs that are available in the street, you can get high and die in about 15 seconds 
with some of the stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, some of the stuff they spray on uh, on marijuana, you know, on the heroin, this fentanyl, and the um, drug cartels coming. Some of the stuff that they're pushing out of Mexico is, I mean, these things it will kill you. Um, we did have one uh, caller. Um, governor who wanted to know if you uh, have you heard you know we're talking about marijuana there's a lot of states that have decided to legalize it have you heard where does the state of north carolina as when you were governor i know that it was it was there was a lot of conversation about it and i i don't i mean me personally i don't support it um only because i i recognize that marijuana is a step drug at least in my opinion and i used to uh, pot was part of my story so i know where it, it took me uh, do you think that it would ever be legalized in the state of North Carolina? You know, the concern I have is not if, but when. Because once the major states like New York, California, Colorado uh, have basically legalized it, you know, it started out as medical. And I always laugh about they call marijuana now recreational marijuana, yeah. which is purely a marketing term. You know, it's one of the. I've always said the tobacco industry should have called cigarettes recreational cigarettes, and we'd still have the Winston Cup. <laughs> That's exactly. But, you know, the, if you think about it, the term recreational marijuana. What's that mean? You're supposed to ride your bike while smoking a joint? Yeah. I mean, it's. But we aren't educating people about the impact of uh, marijuana, and not just a step up drug. There, you know, THC is very, very dangerous, and it's gotten more dangerous because. You know, it's now edible. We don't know the degree and um, higher content. Excuse me. It, it's um, so it's probably not it, but when the good news is this: all these governments were expecting to make all this money from it, but we're finding out that the projections in California and Colorado were about twenty percent of what they projected. Wow! Because they tax it so much, it's like the old cigarette trade. Whereas if you tax something so much, you'll still have the black market, no yep. matter what. Yep. And that's what's happened in California and Colorado is the heck with the high tax. I can get it cheaper around the corner in the black market. And uh, so it's an from a capitalism and uh, standpoint, the market hasn't been as lucrative to government as government anticipated. Yeah. Even John Lukenheimer, uh the mayor of uh, the former mayor of Denver and, and the governor of uh, Colorado ran for president. He was opposed to a Democrat, and um, he's still. Colorado is a real test right now, and you see the homelessness increasing in Denver, and you're seeing other side issues as a result of uh, the legalization of marijuana. Yeah, the, the 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 I think that the books way out on whether it makes sense or not. But, you know, you, you certainly have, um, unfortunately, in our business, the media, um, the true facts are seldom reported um, in such a way as to educate anybody. This usually got a slant um, towards some certain direction that whoever is putting the information out wants to go. Um, uh, Governor, I did want to um, uh, switch gears on you a little bit and talk about... Hey, real quick, real quick, I do want to mention something else about marijuana. And yes, sir. That is not our most serious issue. But the other per problem we have is the human brain is not developed till the age of 25. And if you're drinking a lot or smoking pot a lot or doing other drugs, you're impacting the human brain. Yep. And the long-term ramifications of that are very serious for a mental health system, which is 25% of our state budget right now. Wow. Wow. Well, you, you know, well, I wanted to I wanted to switch into the insurance, and Mike's got a specific um, question that he wanted to pose to you. But the insurance companies, because we all deal with uh, different treatment centers, um, trying to access funds. My wife is a licensed social worker and a um, licensed clinical addiction specialist, and um, her job at the First Health in Pinehurst, she she works at the detox, trying to get people approved. And her job is less about taking care of the individual and more negotiating with the insurance companies, specifically Blue Cross Blue Shield, which seems to control so much of the state of North Carolina. Um, but but we, we wanted to ask, I'll let Mike explain it in, in a way that I'm sure you understand, because we, we talked about it earlier and we were trying to figure out, at the end of the day, insurance controls treatment. It, it, it just does. 
So, Governor McCrory, my, my question, I'm not really going to ask, ask it in a question form, just kind of have an open conversation and, and, you know, maybe you can speak on it. Um, in the media recently, there's pharmaceutical companies that are being held accountable and paying restitution to state governments to support the opioid epidemic. Um, at some point, there are people in the community that feel like insurance companies uh, need to be called called in for the same things. Uh, they approve the claims. They approve the medications to be paid for by insurance. But then you see stories in the media about a family that has lost a loved one uh, post-treatment. Someone accepts treatment, goes to treatment, and because they may go to an out-of-network provider, restitution monies are paid back to the policyholder not to the institution that actually treated them, and that's directly tied to someone getting uh, checks in, in amounts upwards of $10,000 and going out and using, and there's a loss of life. Has there been any discussion, or should there be any discussion on maybe insurance should, you know, open up to paying out-of-network providers directly to keep people in early recovery safer oh i think you raise a great point i think you've answered your own question um and i'd agree with the circumstances the dilemma is how do you distinguish and this is how complex this program is how, how do you make the who makes the decision to pay the provider directly versus the individual and you know we see this in the national debate regarding health care is who is the arbitrator and who is the final decision maker? Is it the doctor? Is it the individual? Is it some committee? Is it government? Um, because there are ramifications regarding uh, the agenda of the ultimate decision maker. And can you trust that decision maker? Do you understand the point I'm making? I Absolutely. Do. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, you know, there is no perfect answer because, as you know, with addiction, every individual has a different situation um you know it's like homelessness every story is different and that's the difficulty and when you talk about large bureaucracies whether it be government or the hospitals or or uh, insurance companies they tend to group people and the question is you know what grouping are you put in without your notice and how do you appeal that grouping and, you know, this gets into lobbying and politics and turf and money. I mean, there's big money in this, too. Uh, there's huge, huge money. money. Huge, mm -hmm. huge money. Huge in this. money. I mean, it's bankrupting government right now. I mean, we, for mental health, as you know, a lot of the people, you know, addiction and mental health, it's a, it's a fine kind of chicken and egg situation for many people. The amount of beds that we have for mental health patients in North Carolina is so small. Yeah. And we just have waiting lists after waiting list for this. So the cost is just tremendous. And then the question is, who pays for it? So, you, um, you know, we all pay for it. I believe when, when history looks back on us in 100 years, our treatment of the mentally ill will be the darkest mark that we receive as a society because people just want to act like it doesn't exist. Um, and, and we created a lot of it too. We uh, and we listen. We will continue to. I mean, Mike and I were talking about anxiety. You know, typically somebody that's in addiction or alcoholism is med medicating themselves because they have some mental illness sure. issue. As you know, social sure. media has brought in a whole new uh, the anxieties that that has created has has caused the medical community to start to actually diagnose it as a disease and so it, it'll only get worse and then I, I don't know um, governor I mean you had in the state of North Carolina is that the insurance commissioner that tries to grapple with that issue I mean no who, who it's, discusses it's, well, that it's primarily the Secretary of Health and Human Services okay for the state of North Carolina which by the way the budget for the Secretary of Health and Human Services is about 20 billion dollars including federal money and, again, about 60% of that funds is due to mental health. Wow. I mean, it's just, it, it, over, it, it was the most overwhelming problem for me as governor. Because 
um, of the complexities and how everyone says it's someone else's problem. Yeah. And then you got a lot of people making money. I mean, and uh, yeah, from profits to nonprofits to uh, trial lawyers, class action lawyers, you know, you know, you get a big settlement, you sue a drug company, you got to find out, you know, we found out with the tobacco settlements that were done in the 80s, you know, you had, you had a lot of people make a lot of money off those class action settlements by a lot of yachts who, you know, would take a 30 to 40 percent cut of hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, and what? so you got to ask yourself if you do class action settlements, whether it be against the insurance company, which they're challenging now, rightfully so, where does the money actually go? Where does it just all go to? Is a large percent of that money just going to go to uh, the overhead of the lawyers becoming extremely wealthy? Yeah, I, that was my, my question. Is how does you know for us in the in the industry? How does does the money ever actually float down to the treatment level to the people who have been harmed the most? Do they ever benefit from it directly? Yeah, the question is how much. It's just like true with any charity. How much actually gets the delivery system through the bureaucracy and through the politics? And I'll, and I'll tell you the other issue. God, there's so many issues, and um, there's no one single answer. Is who controls the information and the data? I had major issues with that as governor. Uh, you know, does the insurance company hold the data? Does government hold the data? Does the individual have the data? Because data is very valuable right now. And uh, how confidential is all data? As we, you know, one, one of my solutions is we've got to share data. But when you share data, you're also challenging the confidentiality of, of an individual's right to keep things quiet. Because then that could impact your insurance in the future and other things. This is a very complex issue with no single answer. I think the first answer is we've got to be honest about what the problem is. And we're still, as a society, not clearly communicating how many people in society actually have an addiction issue and taking the stigma off it. Well, I And as you know, boy, Mason, there's no, you know, the success rate of recovery is still so low. It's gotten better, but as you know, uh, it's still rather low by percentages. Yeah. Even when we get people to the right place. What what's going to? I you know I think what we see in the smaller communities and probably even in the neighborhoods in the bigger urban areas is it's going to have to be considered somewhat of a local problem. It can't be fixed by a big government apparatus because there's just too much. There's, I agree. It's just, you can't, you can't come up with a system that everybody's going to agree to. So what we do is we have a recovery community in Southern Pines, Pinehurst, Sanford, um, and we try and handle the problems ourselves. And we do it through service, and we do it through things that don't necessarily have a price tag. And that's how a lot of the people um, that we work with, they make it because the investment has got to be on the people side. It can't be on the dollar side. You can't buy sobriety. It's not for sale. It requires passionate people that are, are not – afraid to walk into certain bad situations and so you know it is a uh, grassroots is going to be one of the ways it has to be addressed but then you end up in, in invariably you end up bumping up against the bigger system and then you, uh, you know pat I, i'll watch these conversations about health care and you know the only thing that seems to be obvious to me is, is it's never going to get fixed I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see a day coming where everybody's happy with the solution. I found, I think you're, you're onto something here. It reminds me of dealing with urban decay as mayor. You know, you have a, a slum area and high crime area. And to me, you got to take it block by block. Yeah. Yeah. Block by block. Yeah. You, you know, know it, decay happens block by block. Addiction occurs people by people. And you just gotta, you gotta reverse that trend. Yeah, it, individual it, by individual, and it's going to take not just the government. By the way, it's got to take nonprofits. It's got to take churches. 
uh, we all have to be a part of the interdiction, and we can't also be, uh, uh, what's the word for dealing with someone with addiction? I've just gone blank. Uh, um, you, you mean enable. A, we yeah, can't be enablers. Yeah, right. Well, that unfortunately, that's what I, I feel. i got to tell you, I feel so bad for the local sheriffs and the deputies because you know, they're the ones that are getting stuck with, they're the ones that are getting stuck with no system in place. And everybody creates their own solution um, on the fly. I mean, tonight in Moore County and in Lee County, those those deputies, whoever is watching the local county jail is going to have their hands full. And, that you know, they're not trained for that kind of stuff. So it is, it is, it is a huge problem. Um, but at least... And it goes through generations then, too. As you know, Megan, sad to say, with your children, you probably have some sort of, you know, the likelihood of some of your children being addicted is probably higher. No question about it. And, and you know. Just, but I, you've got to educate your children now. And thank God you I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Well, I, I appreciate that. You, you saw me. The next battle is with your children to make sure they don't make the same mistakes, but the likelihood from a genetic makeup is, you know, just like with me, with Alzheimer's, my mom had Alzheimer's and, you know, it, it, some of this, as I've learned, this subject is, is genetic. Um, and more, some people are more apt if they, you know, I, I'm fortunate. I can have one beer and stop. Yeah. You're normal. That, well, that's, I don't know if that's normal or not. Maybe, but, maybe you know what? Abnormal. Well, you know what? Unfortunately, it's considered because of the glorification of cocktails and lifestyle and all the other sure. stuff. Is it's not considered normal. But I will tell you this, and I'm not saying. I mean, this is certainly no blanket statement. But it's getting to be a little bit cooler to be sober. There's some. There are people coming out. There I are. Love it. There are recovery movements that you will see, and they will gain. Uh, strength, um, because the it's life and death. You know, Governor, it was always life and death, but it's reaching a better class of people, if you will, and it's really starting. It's you. really starting to catch people's attention that, you know, it's 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 the the head cheerleader who they found in the bathroom with a needle in her arm and she's dead from a heroin overdose. That's not that didn't happen 20 years ago, and it's happening today. Right. So well, you know, the other thing is. You know, it used to be where, you know, I'd be at a college party just like everyone else, and everyone's trying to get drunk. And some people would say, you know, I'd say, have a drink. And they go, no, no, come on, you wuss, have a drink. And now when I hear someone peer pressure someone else into having a drink or taking drugs, I really, I inter, I intervene yeah. as a third party. I go, stop it. That person doesn't want to drink. And think of all the parties you want to where they just pump alcohol. Oh, you know, I, know, I had fundraisers where, you know, the minute you walk in the house and they give you a glass of wine. But now I'm noticing they're offering wine or water, and you're not embarrassed to take the water. Right. And it's being accepted. And I think that is, you know, it's kind of like the old mothers against drunk driving. We almost ought to use their model where the mothers kind of lead the charge. When you and I are about the same age, when we were in high school, driving drunk wasn't even re looked down upon. Oh, I got drunk last night and drove drunk. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, badge of, it was a ba a badge of courage. driving put a shame on that. <laughs> well, th th you know what, that's the truth. But I will tell you, there are some communities I, I can think of. Uh, Asheville's got a great recovery community. Uh, Wilmington. I agree. I, in fact, I've given, I've, I've, I've uh, been to the homeless shelter there in Nashville, and also they've got a great recovery center there where my wife and I have helped when we were governor. Personally visited many times and gave donations to, you know, their Charlotte shelter here, the men's shelter here. They're not just putting people in the shelter, but they're looking at recovery now because right. they realize so many of those men and women, you know. And now when I was mayor, I don't know if you remember this, Macon, but... I got people got furious with me when I tell don't give money to the homeless. You know, when someone asks you for a buck, don't give it to the homeless. Give it to the homeless shelter, right? That's or right. the Salvation Army, someone who's going to help. Because if you give it to the person directly who's begging on the street, 
you know and I know that's going straight toward a liquor bottle or drugs. Yeah, it is for a fact. It is for a fact. Well, listen, Pat, we're, 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 we're running up against the end of the show, but I did want to ask you one question, give you a minute or two sure. to, to address it. What's next for, uh, for Pat McCrory? I'm kind of going through that assessment right now. I, I went through a big change of uh, losing my job. <laughs> and, you know, we all go through losing your job, and you've got to go through the grief period of that, and the change of that, and your ego of that. And it's taken me a while to go through that, just like we all have had. You've had to go through that, right, Megan? Absolutely. <clears throat> so I've kind of gone through that process, and I'm getting my feet back on the floor and getting back up and holding my shoulders up and say I was proud of the work we did, and now I'm trying to figure out the next steps to be relevant, to make a difference, and leave this state and our society a better place than when we arrived. So I'm looking at a couple political options, and in the meantime, I'm having fun doing my radio and doing some business, but I hope this isn't my last uh, – the governor's job is not my last job. Let me put it that way in public service. Well, I, listen, I'm, I mean, from a personal perspective, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, <clears throat> it's nice to know the people that you vote for. And um, I, I certainly know, uh, I know enough about you that when I would cast that ballot, for whatever it is, I'd feel good about it. So, um, uh, You're kind. And the only thing I've had to really adjust to, I had to learn how to drive again. <laughs> um, I didn't drive for four years, so it Stay away from me on the road. I'm a terrible driver. Well, let me ask you one other quick question. How's your golf? <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> and I still remember a piece of advice you gave me, and I'm going to have to go back and remember that. I remember you said, well, I can't say it on the radio. <laughs> People will take it out of it. But you, you told me how to move one part of the chest to the other part of the chest. I'll never forget this. You told me something 20 years ago on the driving range, and uh, – I'll never be as good as you, let me tell you that. So. <laughs> well, listen, I, and, and are you still playing golf over at the park? You, 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 I, I am. I can still, uh, you, I still, I can still see you and Bob Lacey, and um, I'm trying to think. You had you had a great foursome that you used to yeah, play golf with. Yeah, I had with. a great. Jim Rogers and Charlie Smith and Bob Stevens. Bob who Stevens. ended up being my chief legal counsel in the governor's office. Yeah, well, well listen, when you see them, tell them all I said hello, if you don't mind. And I will make it. I'm, I just want to say, keep this program up, and uh, you know, people need to talk about it more. You know, the people who aren't going through addiction and don't have family members dealing with addiction, they're naive. That's and right. It's not their fault. Yeah, or they're not being honest about it. You and I both or know not that. Being honest about yeah, it. you Sorry. and I both know that. There's it's it's strange. You know, I drive a Lincoln Town Car. Uh, for for money sometimes, and uh, the people I take to the airport, I will tell you 95% of them. By the time I tell them what I do, that they tell me their story, and it's um, it's yeah. amazing. And you know what? Well, like everything else, you don't. It's someone else's problem until it hits you directly through a family member or close friend. Right. Well, right now it's very hard to find someone not close to your way to you who's going through this problem. No question about it. And I will tell you, I think people are dying to talk about it. They just have to be invited to, and that's what we're going to try and do. So thank you for your what time. What a great idea. Thank you for your time God tonight. God bless you guys. Thank you very much. All right, and I'll see you next time, Guff. Thank you very you much. You got it. Call anytime. All right. Bye-bye, well. Macon. Thanks, buddy. Mike. He's a good man. I, I knew that we would enjoy it, and um, we didn't get nearly as much information as I would have liked to have gotten No, from you're going to have to have him back on. Well, there, there's so many topics that we did not get an opportunity to dive into. Well, I especially enjoyed the uh, – because, you know, you guys, at well, when you deal with the on the insurance side and you see it firsthand, and it is a, it's a fundamental problem. Yeah, I, I think Governor McCrory was right on the money. It is a much bigger conversation. Um that needs to be discussed yeah. at, at every level. Well, listen, man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming in. I'm telling Lewis that he can go ahead and take the rest of the month off. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> There's a new sheriff in town. His name's Mike. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, and we want to thank um, everybody um, that has uh, that's, um, participated in the show tonight. Um, this show will be posted um, on our website, therecoveryboys.com. Um, Please reach out to us with comments, questions. Um, if you want to give us um, your ideas on what our next show, maybe somebody that we could bring in as a guest that you'd like to hear from, um, we would love to do that. I'll be honest with you, I'd love to get into a little bit deeper conversation about this whole marijuana thing because it's so topical right now. 
So we promise that we'll keep on doing this show as long as people are interested in, in this. Uh, listen, it's a topic that needs to get discussed. Absolutely. So, uh, Mike, you have a good week. I appreciate you coming in, and um, we look forward to catching up with everybody next week. Thanks, thanks, Megan. thanks so much. You've been listening to The Recovery Boys on WFJA. Visit The Recovery Boys website at therecoveryboys.com. We thank you for listening to The Recovery Boys.